America's first self-made millionaire is called this grand estate her home. And today it has undergone a design transformation, bringing a piece of history back to life. The details up next on Designing for History, the Madam Walker Show House. From the daughter of freed slaves to America's first millionaires, from shack to chateau, from grit to glamour, the story of Madame C.J. Walker is an awe-inspiring one. And eight decades later, her home is being transformed to once again become a showplace. Hi, I'm Joan Cohn, and welcome to Designing for History, the Madame Walker Showhouse. When it was completed in 1918, the New York Times called this home a place fit for a fairy princess. Madame Walker's 35-room Mediterranean-style mansion was built overlooking the Hudson River. Many of America's most spectacular castles are built here. This beautiful, unspoiled area became an enchanted kingdom and a playground for the men who dominated Wall Street at the turn of the century. Jay Gould, known as the Wizard of Wall Street, and the most notorious of the robber barons built a 40-room Gothic-style mansion here known as Lyndhurst. Even today, its architectural splendor remains a testament to America's finest Gothic revival style. Frederick William Vanderbilt was part of one of America's wealthiest families, and according to the New York Times, Vanderbilt bought the finest 600 acres on the Hudson and built a 50-room, 50 50,000-square-foot 50 mansion here. And in the early 1900s, no one made more money than John D. Rockefeller. His fortune in the oil refining business rose to $1 billion. And it's here on 4,000 acres of prime real estate in the Hudson Valley that Rockefeller built his castle, a six-story, 40-room Georgian-style mansion known as Kaikit. But it's probably safe to say that neither Rockefeller, Gould, nor any of the Vanderbilts who lived in the Hudson Valley ever socialized with Madame Walker. Because while the Hudson Valley attracted America's wealthiest families, very few of its residents ever thought a black person would be included in this exclusive neighborhood, let alone a black woman. But that's exactly what happened in the fall of 1916. Initially, when she started building the house, some people thought that perhaps it was someone's maid coming to inspect the property. And when they realized that Madame Walker herself was the person who was going to move into the property, some people saw it as an invasion. For Madame Walker, it was more than a dream come true. It was almost a mythical rags-to-riches fairy tale. Born Sarah Breedlove in 1867 on a Delta, Louisiana plantation, this daughter of former slaves transformed herself from an uneducated farm laborer in the cotton fields to a celebrated entrepreneur, philanthropist, and social activist. She was orphaned at age seven, married at age 14, a mother at 17, and a widow by age 20. Madam Walker had everything going against her, but somehow she persevered and triumphed. As she sought a better life for herself and her two-year-old daughter, Madam Walker moved to St. Louis, where she earned a reputation as a first-class washerwoman. But as a washerwoman, she was making $1.50 a week, and it wasn't going to make her life improve in any measurable way anytime soon. And she said, I prayed to God one day when I was washing clothes, my arms were buried in soap suds, and I said, how am I ever going to improve my life? How am I, a poor washerwoman, ever going to have a better life? Well, coincidentally, around the same time, her hair had begun to fall out. Uh, she had scalp disease, a very severe scalp disease that was very common among African-American women and white women at the time. Madam Walker experimented and ended up creating a scalp treatment that restored her hair and then turned a $1.50 investment into a thriving hair care products company in just seven years. In 1910, Madam Walker established a company headquarters in Indianapolis, a city that was at the heart of America's transportation network. By 1912, Madam Walker had trained a force of African-American women as sales agents that numbered 2,000. Five years later, she had organized her sales force into a union and held what may have been the first annual convention for American businesswomen. She adopted the title Madam in keeping with the fashion of many women proprietors of her era 
and attached it to her second husband's last name, Walker. However, her second marriage ended in divorce in 1912. And four years later, Madam Walker purchased this property in the exclusive Irvington on the Hudson neighborhood. She hired Vertner Tandy, the first black architect licensed in New York, to create what she said was a dream of dreams. I would describe this house as being an American eclectic design, American in the, in the sense of its originality, eclectic in terms of the architectural styles from which it was copied. Clearly there are some Mediterranean influences here, Spanish, Italian, with influences of, of Moorish architecture as well. The front of the house reflects the fact that it was built in the second decade of the 20th century. And that is to say, it would have been a perfectly symmetrical facade, except for the fact that Tandy chose to add a significant portco share at the side of the house to accommodate her automobile. And Madam Walker was one of the first to have a big, fancy automobile. The back side is really much more elegant than the front is. There's an enormous staircase that leads down from the rear rooms here on the first floor to a pool about a level and a half down. This is a wonderful gesture towards the river. When it was completed, the cost of Madam Walker's mansion on the Hudson was $350,000. During a visit to the home, world-famous tenor Enrico Caruso said the finished result was so similar to estates in his native Italy, he gave the mansion an Italian-sounding name, Villa Luaro. And unlike her neighbors, the Rockefellers, the Goulds, and the Vanderbilts, Madam Walker built her castle in full view. Madam Walker built her house close to the street. It's a statement, I think, on Broadway, a very bold statement, that everyone who drove through this very wealthy village would see the home of Madam C.J. Walker, the wealthiest African-American woman in the country. She was not only the wealthiest black woman alive, but she's listed in the Guinness Book of World Records as the first self-made American woman to become a millionaire of any race. And now, eight decades later, Madam Walker's home still stands as an inspiring beacon to all who enter. Villa Luaro has undergone a transformation by interior designers and artisans who have brought this mansion back to life. The main salon, or reception hall, has undergone one of the largest design transformations. Here, guests are awed by the expansive ceiling that is English in its architectural design. The restoration took about four weeks to do. Originally, the ceiling was painted pink and white, which was totally wrong. So we did our research, and we decided that the blue would be the right color for the ceiling. And so with a lot of undercoating and mixing of paints, we actually achieved the right color and then we started the work and the gilding and, um, well, as you can see, it, um, it has turned out very well. In addition to the ceiling, the Italian design bronze chandelier is original to the room. Other original elements in the main salon include the handcrafted moldings and fireplace, which have been recreated with a limestone finish. And around the ornately carved fireplace, an inviting seating area is created with matching sofas and accented with an array of pillows. We chose uh, sort of a random collection of pillows in the same colors with varying textures and styles. Again, just to, to add a sense of liveliness. The, the sofa style is formal, but with the addition of the assorted pillows, it gives it a more comfortable, welcoming feel. To spark further design interest in the room, a unique ottoman was created using a 19th century silk kimono. The Japanese fabric is in direct contrast to the Italian fabric chosen for the skirt on the welcoming table. Throughout the main salon, one-of-a-kind antiques and traditional artwork, which are reflective of Madame Walker's day and style, are combined with contemporary and ethnic furnishings. We wanted to give the house a historical, elegant feeling, but have some fun at the same time. I think we've given the room a bit of excitement by combining the very traditional look that would have been Madam Walker's look with something that appeals to people of today. 
From the eclectic look of the main salon to Madam Walker's favorite room, the elegant music room. Just ahead, the transformation continues on Designing for History, the Madam Walker Show House. Madam Walker's home on the Hudson is full of firsts. She was the first self-made millionaires. She hired the first licensed black architect in New York to design her dream house. And today the home is owned by the first African American to hold a seat on the New York Stock Exchange. Harold Doley, like Madam Walker, has Louisiana roots and first saw Villa Luaro in 1968 when he was 21 years old. I saw Villa Luaro 30 years ago when I was in training to be a stockbroker. Uh, I took a ride out uh, one weekend uh, on the train and walked around the villa. I did not come in. And I decided at that point that one day Villa Luaro would be a part of my life and my family's life. 25 years after first seeing the house, Harold bought this historic home on the Hudson in 1993, becoming the first African-American owner of the house since Madam Walker. He and his wife Helena are trying to preserve history while making this mansion their home. I think I realized from the beginning what a responsibility it was and was going to be to share this house with the community and also a challenge in making the mansion a home for us all. I think I realized that probably more than Harold did. While the main salon has undergone a complete interior design transformation, the elegant music room, or what's known as the gold room, looks much like it did in Madam Walker's day. This palatial 18 by 40 foot room is encrusted with gold leaf and delicate paintings fill the ceiling and the walls. 24 pilasters surround the room, each topped off with a capital that is sparkling with French gold leaf. The center ceiling medallion is faux finished with an airy design and a diamond pattern is painted on panels on each side. Hanging from the decorative ceiling are two lavish crystal chandeliers imported from Italy. These decorative light fixtures are original to Madame Walker's day. This glittering room was home for Madame Walker's most prized possession, an Esty organ, which cost $25,000 before installation. At, at the time, in 1918, an Esty organ was really quite a status piece to have in your home. And Madame Walker uh, wanted to make sure that her house was, had the best of everything. And when she ordered the organ, uh, the people in Brattleboro, Vermont were quite happy to sell it to her. But when they shipped it to her, they shipped it in unmarked boxes. And the story is, is that they didn't really want anyone white to know that they were selling this beautiful organ to a black woman. Although a cherished possession, the SD organ gave the architect a challenge. How to hide the pipes in these elegant surroundings? Organ pipes are usually exposed in a room like that. But organ pipes would have been a little bit too gothic, I think, for Tandy's taste in this particular case. And so he, he, he created an organ chest that had a wonderful grillage over it that matches all the op opposing architecture in the room uh, in symmetry and in style, uh, complete with gold trim and everything else to go with it. The music room is where Madam Walker's granddaughter was photographed at her 1923 million dollar wedding. 9,000 guests were on the invitation list and the ceremony made headlines. Her daughter also entertained here often and was photographed in front of Madame Walker's ornately hand-carved grand piano. Today, designer Warren Kenneth Carter has restored the grandeur and luster of yesteryear. He's added more spark to this room by choosing a seating area alive with color. The colors in the room came from the colors in the murals over the doors. That's how I arrived at using these reds and the jewel tones. If you take a look, the sofas and the little small Victorian chair, um, the colors are in the murals over the door. I played with a little silk. I played with some quilt. I played with some velvet. But it's all quiet and subtle, so it all like blends in. It's, it won't jump out at you. You really have to go into the room and really stare it out. Everything is just flowing in the room. Three of the four murals in the arches above the doorways are original to the music room. 
However, one of the murals was badly damaged. So Warren used computer technology and copied one of the scenes to create a new mural. Along the center walls, Warren added mirrors to create even more grandeur. And the two Louis XV chests are among his favorite pieces in the room. The reason why I like these Bombay chests so much, they have so much detail to them. You could look at these pieces all day long and just come up with, there's a gold on it, there's a little carvings on it, there's inlays, they're just a beautiful piece of furniture. And it is above one of these chests that a sconce, original to Madam Walker's day, mysteriously turns itself on and off. I was told by the owners of the house that every so often, that one particular sconce might come on and stay on for maybe three or four days and then go off. And uh, they like it. And I think it adds a little flavor to the room too. Many of the musical greats of Madame Walker's day spent time in this music room that she so treasured. And if she were alive today, no doubt Madame Walker would also adore the modern day music salon which has been added during this design transformation. We'll talk with the designer. When Designing for History, the Madam Walker Show House continues. One of the focal points in Madam C.J. Walker's grand mansion, as we've seen, is the music room. In her day, the SD organ pumped music throughout Madam Walker's home. And in a way, this incredible mansion was built around the organ to allow enough room in the walls for the organ's pipes and grills. But today, Madam Walker's home moves into the 21st century with the technology that has created a thoroughly modern music room. Designer Charles Pavarini III has brought new light to the turn of the century concept of the music salon. Charles, this is a gorgeous room, but was there a special challenge in designing a modern room in a home with so much of a past? I wanted to keep the original architecture of the room and to interface a modern feeling on top of that. Well, what did you have when you started in this room? There was nothing here except great moldings, great proportions, and a beautiful wood floor. Well, there's an interesting geometry and two terrific windows in this, in this room, so that gave you a good start. The windows are terrific, and that's what really drew me to the space, because when you walk into the space, the focus is on the windows. This window treatment astonishes me. It's so female and gorgeous. How did you come up with it? I wanted to treat the windows, yet not obliterate the beautiful architecture of a plate-in window. Thus, the kiwi shear. And that is contrasted by a bronze velvet cuff. And the draperies are cut on the bias, giving us the soft folds that are found in garments of the Art Deco period. One of the rooms at the show house was designed with the thought that a very specific modern day celebrity might use it. For the music salon, Charles was inspired by Vanessa Williams. Imagining her rehearsing here, he put a microphone next to the piano and an oversized mirror just across from it. Besides making a powerful design statement, this mirror is a practical rehearsal tool because of the high-tech television equipment it hides. To create his look, Charles combined the design styles of Art Deco and 1940s French with unusual but luscious color choices, kiwi, mahogany, and bronze. Tell me about the wall color. The wall is a custom color. It is heliotrope, which is a blend between a blue and a red. Tell me about this very special piano. The piano is from 1932. It's a perfect example of the Art Deco period. It's satin wood and ebony detailing. It's Wellmar from London. It's a jewel. I hope it sounds half as good as it looks in this room. It does. Speaking of looks, the daybed, the fabrics, describe it. I designed the daybed as well as the mirror, specifically for the room. I had a certain concept in mind of a daybed and it is mahogany, and the fabric on it is a silk jacquard by Gretchen Bellinger. It's called Spread Your Wings. It's beautiful. The contrasting fabric? The contrasting fabric is a silk, again, a silk stripe. The warmth of the wood is echoed in your beautiful ceiling treatment. Can you tell me about it? Yes, that is a bronze paint. 
and I did that specifically to bring the warm tones of the wood at the floor plane up to the ceiling. And inside the moldings, something unique on a ceiling. Yes, I painted them and they're faux painted in a limestone. The moldings are original to the house and it's beautifully done and I wanted to express that. Well, and we have to talk about the chandelier. Chandelier is quite extraordinary. Made for this room, I'm sure. <laughs> that is avocado green glass. It is a signed 1957 Murano hand-blown glass chandelier by Benini. There is so much effervescence, so much energy, luminescence uh, coming from your fabrics, the pottery. Can you talk to me about that? That, I feel, sparks a room, is to mix your textures where you have dull against luminescence. The pottery is a Zolne, that is from 1905. Oh, beautiful. So Madame Walker might very well have had some of these beautiful pieces in her home. That could very well be. When she first created yes. it. It's beautiful. Well, speaking of something that shines, I really favor this beautiful table. It's like a piece of, like a diamond sitting here. When I was looking at pieces for the room, as you can see, I used a lot of wood tones and mixes of wood. And I was looking at something that would give us lightness in the middle of the room and just a spark like a diamond. This room is dedicated to the art of music, but you've also filled it with beautiful art. Can you tell me about the pieces you chose? Sure. The sculpture was exhibited in 1925 in Paris. It's a signed piece by Armanoff and a perfect example of the Art Deco period. And the painting, which looks like it grew in this room. That is a contemporary artist that I found in Soho, Delphine Petitchine, and it is acrylic on canvas. Charles, have you ever imagined Madame Walker coming into this room you created? Yes, Joan, I think that Madame Walker would appreciate a new twist on the turn of the century music salon and see that what we've done to bring it forward. I think she would say that this room, using her own words, is very swell, <laughs> and it is. Coming up next on Designing for History, the Madame Walker Show House, a master suite reminiscent of a French country estate. Madame Walker's home on the Hudson was a testament to her success and a source of inspiration for others, not only to achieve, but to give. As her business grew, so did Madame Walker's reputation as a philanthropist. She gave financial gifts to orphanages, retirement homes, created scholarships for black students, funded teachers, and supported social organizations like the YWCA and the YMCA. Madame Walker had herself grown up in dire poverty. And as she began to make more money, she realized that other people needed help. She wanted to um, make sure that she was using her money to help other people. And she really was quite a, a spiritual religious woman and she believed that the more you gave, the more that came to you. And so she gave in that uh, very biblical spirit. But probably her largest gift was $5,000 to the NAACP's anti-lynching fund in the spring of 1919, just before she died. And at the time, it was the largest gift that the NAACP had ever received. Madam Walker died of kidney failure caused by high blood pressure in May of 1919, less than a year after she moved into her enchanted castle. She was 51. Having the finest in furnishings, Madam Walker died in her custom-made canopy bed surrounded by doctors and friends. Today, her bedroom has been restored to a luxurious master suite. I felt that there was um, a lot of history in that room. She was a powerful woman. And uh, so when we were thinking about how we wanted to put this room together, a lot of her history came in to play in this. I read that she loved French design and she loved Aubusson's. And that was really the beginning of our thought process is how we put the room together it was an Aubusson rug. When we picked the Aubusson rug as the center point of the room, we decided we would love to use toiles because of the French nature of it. And we also wanted to pick something of a historical nature, so we picked a document pattern and the document color. We were very taken with um, mixing toiles. A lot of people were are afraid to mix the two 
different twalls together. So we felt that she was a woman way before her time and wouldn't have been afraid to do that. Lori combined twalls for the pillows and furnishings, and she also used the silk fabric on the formal window treatments. The window treatments were designed to be very elaborate. We had three, we have three different treatments on the windows. Uh, we have a sheer fabric, which we felt it would be nice to block out the road, which was there in the very beginning. We used panels, which she could close at night, and then we had a very elaborate valance treatment over the windows. We did some history and, of course, of other types of window treatments that she may have used in the home, and this definitely was something that was of the period. Lori says she had a wonderful backdrop to begin her designs because the fireplace, the moldings, and the chandelier are all original to the room. When we first viewed the room, we saw the chandelier but had no idea of how magnificent it actually was going to become. We had it taken down and professionally cleaned, and when we put it back, the owner didn't even recognize it. The moldings are magnificent. We really wanted to highlight them. And that's one of the reasons why we painted them the color that we did to highlight them and also put the wallpaper within the moldings. And that also made the moldings jump out at you. Today, it's very difficult to recreate those because craftsmen really carve those by hand. But we wanted to make sure that people who viewed the room had a sense and feeling of the magnificence of these moldings. The fireplace has a quilted pattern that surrounds it, something that's very difficult to do and I've never seen reproduced today. But that was one of the inspirations for the wallpaper that we used and also the mirror that we used above it, which also mimicked that type of quilting pattern. To achieve the look of a grand French country estate, Laurie chose a number of reproductions in this room. We used many reproductions of furniture in the room. We wanted to show people who came to the home to view it that they too could afford to have beautiful furniture. And that's why we chose furniture that was available today and they were reproductions. We used a few antiques in the room, but most of the other pieces were reproductions. The bed is a reproduction of a French bed that was done years ago. The height of the headboard came into play when we were designing the room. We wanted to accentuate the wonderful ceilings in the room. And also, when we put the beautiful pillows on the bed, we also wanted you to be able to see the magnificence of the style of the bed. Lori also designed the small sunroom, which is part of the master suite. Well, we wanted to put a little bit of whimsy in there. We also wanted to have a place where Madame Walker could go and read a book get totally away from her business, and be completely different and yet meld in with her bedroom. Thus, we use the light colors, that wonderful settee, which is also a reproduction, an old um, reproduction table, actually, that we found in England and brought over was the coffee table, and then that great painted bookshelf. So it was wonderful to be able to get inside her head and think, all right, I want to read a good book. I'm going to go out to my sun porch, look at my Hudson River view, and sit there and really relax. We enjoyed mixing the furniture in the sunroom. We took actually two antique chairs that we had faux painted um, and a reproduction settee. We purposely didn't use any wicker out there because we really didn't feel that Madame Walker would have used wicker out there. We wanted it to be a comfortable place, a place that, where she may go out and read a good book, where she wouldn't do business out there, but enjoy the views and the sun that comes in so magnificently through those windows. We wanted to use window treatments out there that would give her some privacy, but would also let all the light in, no matter if it was a sunny day in the summer and she could look out at the trees or it was snowing. We wanted her to be able to enjoy all four seasons out there. Lori wanted to create not only a beautiful master suite, but one Madame Walker would have found pleasing. I hope that we got inside her head and made every dream come true. And I think that she might have walked in and said, magnificent. Coming up next on Designing for History, the Madam Walker Show House, a room created specifically for the lady of the house, the boudoir.
we've already seen the public side of this fine mansion, the rooms designed for entertaining. But now, we're in the boudoir, which Lisa McTurnan has designed for the private side of Madame Walker. Boudoir, that's a word we don't hear very often. I think it's a French word for a woman's retreat. And in doing some research on Madame Walker, she was such a busy lady, like many of us are today. And I think that she really needed a space to just relax and unwind. So how do you see her in this room? I see her relaxing. Um, she was a very spiritual person. In doing some research, I heard that she always had a Bible nearby. In fact, one of the things that I have positioned right next to this chaise longue is the 23rd Psalm. So there was a strong spiritual side to this yes, woman. Yes, very much so. Well, this room would be very comforting, I would imagine, for her. And, and that's your fantasy as well. Yes. Well, I think that one of the secrets of good design is making it specific for the person who lives there. Uh, what have you put on her vanity table? I have some French perfume bottles on there. The uh, lamps themselves are lucite with uh, string shades, and I needed a little color over there, so I hand glued the glass beads all around the perimeter of the shades. That dressing table, um, I wanted it to stand out a little bit, and that's why I positioned it on an angle in the room. I thought that would be nicer as opposed to straight up against a wall. Um, and I think it works very well. Lisa, you seem to find the perfect mirror for that vanity table. Thank you. Yes, I think it's simple but yet elegant, which is what I try to do in the room here. Um, it has an interesting pattern of cut mirror all the way around the perimeter. How did you choose the colors? I wanted the colors to be very neutral. Um, I think neutral is great. You don't grow tired of it. Um, I did add some sprinkling of purple around for some life, but for the most part, um, gray greens, taupes, beiges. The walls are hand rubbed. I created a glaze by mixing a paint color, which was a green, and I made it transparent by incorporating glaze and a little bit of water to it. So I came back with a rag and hand rubbed the walls. In fact, when you look closely, you could see the motion of my hand on there. I had uh, stencils designed for the corners of the room. On there, you'll notice the leaves of the vine that uh, trail around the stencil are the same size leaves that we used from the window treatment. The window treatment is beautiful. Can you describe it for me? We started with the under treatment, which is a sheer fabric. Um, with a cut design on it. Framing the soft Romans are silk panels that actually have a bump cloth from England in them which uh, make the fabric hang nicer and it's almost like a quilt inside. In Europe, I think it was very drafty over there and that's probably where the concept came from, but for us uh, it just makes uh, especially silk fabrics hang very nice and makes them look richer. And then on top of the uh, panels, I incorporated little buttons, yes. um, which are of a cut velvet, actually the same cut velvet that I used on one of the pillows to try to make a connection there again. And that adds a little bit of purple. So I tried to sprinkle the purple around, but things like that, and again, when I was talking about the leaves, a connection that I hoped wouldn't jump out as soon as you walk in the room, but if you linger, you'll, you'll make the connection of some of these things in the room? Well, these are the kinds of things that uh, non-professionals love to learn about to make their rooms look more beautiful. Well, there are other personal things that you chose from Madam Walker's retreat. Can you describe to me how you chose the chaise? Well, I thought the chaise would be very nice as a place for her to relax, and I really envision her sitting here with a cup of tea after um, a busy night with friends and just relaxing here. And of course, we all need a throw to, to cuddle up with. Lisa, the purses are very charming. I wanted to do a collection in the room. I felt, first of all, it just immediately said this was a woman's space. Um, and I think a collection is great to have in a room because it adds a personal interest. Um, all the women that came into the room were fascinated. Also, I wanted the way they were mounted to um, be interesting and I found old draw poles to display them on and I think that kind of gave it a dis like a sculptural aspect to the wall. It's beautiful. You've included fresh flowers and plants in the room. How did you make those choices? Well, I do like to include plant life into a room and I, um, I like green, I like nature. 
Um, and I wanted a topiary on this table. I felt it really needed some height, so the topiary worked really well. I put a pedestal behind us because I felt the room with the tall ceilings needed some height. And the urn was an old urn. And in putting the cow lilies in there, I felt they were somewhat of a historical flower and an, an elegant flower. And all the old photographs, especially even looking at my grandmother's old wedding album, she had cow lilies. And I think that they just remind me of a flower that was around a lot in the 1918s, and I could see it here in Madame Walker's yes, home. Yes, I think they're a nice tribute to Madame Walker. The armoire is very handsome. Thank you. I had that custom made for the room. It's made out of walnut, solid walnut. Because it's such a large piece, it's over seven feet tall, I didn't want it to appear too massive, so I found antique glass to front the cabinet with. And um, I think that also adds intrigue to what's behind it. Inside, I arranged some hats and hat boxes, and really whatever collection you would have had in there, it, it just adds some interest. Tell me about the chandelier. The chandelier is probably the only original piece um, that I have in this room. Um, but I didn't hand it. I added the medallion to it, the shades I added, and they're the same string shades that are on her dressing table. And at night, it looks very nice with the light just streaming through the string shades. It's a lovely chandelier. It's interesting that she spent her whole business life encouraging other women to find their own beauty, and she was very successful at doing that. How nice that you've created a room for her personal pleasure and for her to find her own beauty. Thank you. Thank you so much. From quiet, private spaces like the garden room and this lovely boudoir, to a room designed for an active family. That's up next on Designing for History, the Madam Walker Show House. Time Magazine has named Madam Walker as one of the 100 most influential business leaders of the 20th century. She was also commemorated with a United States postal stamp in 1998. Madam Walker was clearly a woman ahead of her time, not only as a successful businesswoman and millionaire, but as a philanthropist. She once said, my object in life is not simply to make money for myself or to spend it on myself in dressing or running around in an automobile but I love to use a part of what I make in trying to help others. It seems only fitting that Madam Walker's spirit of giving remain a legacy long after her death, so appropriately, this show house has a beneficiary, the United Negro College Fund. One of the designers involved in this project has directly benefited from this organization. Amani Thorpe is a UNCF scholarship winner. Amani, Madam Walker said that this house was her dream of dreams. It must be somewhat of a dream for you to work on this project, design this beautiful room. Absolutely it was. Madam Walker, I believe, was a woman of elegance, of culture and sophistication. I believe this room really reflects that. Let me ask you this. In this house, we have two currents meeting directly. The past, all that wonderful rich history, and the present, because uh, the Dolies live here with their, their son. And uh, so you had two elements to unite. Is this design more a part of the past or a part of the present? Well, I think it is a part of the present in that, I mean, it is a concurrent media center. The elegance of the room, I think, really shows itself from the past. It really brings her elegance and culture to the room. Um, Lola has a little bit of grit underneath, which is exactly what she came from. You had a big space to work in, but it feels very cozy. How did you accomplish this feeling? Well, one thing I wanted to do was have a family room that could handle all the responsibilities that the family would need it to handle. Um, so my primary focus was to bring in a bunch of different activities. What I did was map out the room and identify four separate areas, and the room dictated some of that. Um, there's an area where the workspace is divided from the game table space, which is separated naturally by a rainy other cover, of all things. Um, then the fireplace creates another focal point where I made an intimate, cozy, kind of reading, cuddling section. I see. Then the nexus, really, of the room is where the pinnacle, where there's a pinnacle from the dormers. So um, in that space, I wanted it to be very cozy, lots of life. So that's where the largest seating area is. Yeah. Was it a challenge being in a room with uh, these sharp angles? It's not a regular ceiling. Not at all. In fact, it was a great challenge. When I first saw the room, I fell in love with it for that reason, because oh, it wasn't you? a box. It was a, an odd-shaped room just in the floor plan, and then the ceilings are 
very unexpected. Even in, even an attic ceiling that's just got normal dormers in two directions is one thing, but this ceiling juts out in all bunch of different directions that are really quite unexpected. So how did you work that to your advantage? Well, for one, I wanted to create that also in design. Um, I wanted to have the design be unexpected as well. And I also put things askew on an angle. Um, for instance, a seating area, the seating area in front of the fireplace is kind of haphazardly almost off the carpet, um, which gives it kind of that, again, that kind of angled feeling. You did some unique things with lighting in this room. I'd like to hear about how you chose the lamps and other details on the lighting. Well, the only fixtures that are original to the room were the ceiling fixtures, so that really left out a lot of opportunity to add some lamps into the room, and a necessity, in fact. Uh, the original fixtures were bare bulbs, so to soften that, I put shades on them. The lamps, the table lamps and the floor lamp, um, they're all different. I didn't make a pair. I mean, that, again, adds to the eclecticism of the room. Um, not so matched, not stiff. This corner of the room is very interesting with the lighting that you chose. It's a way to lengthen the room in spots that would have been dead. Um, in order to illuminate the corners there in a beautiful manner, I put the lamp inside of a vase. Wonderful. Well, the vase reminds me of probably what's the most dominant feature in this room design-wise, and that is this eclectic cultural mix. Uh, can you tell me how you came up with that? It is a very big multicultural mix. Uh, there are Roman influences, uh, for instance, in the bookends on the sofa table uh, and the canthus leaf motif on those bookends. Also, um, African influences. Um, you find those in the watering vessels underneath the sofa table. And um, there are some Japanese influences and Chinese influences and some of the pottery and the furniture. And also American influences um, in the arts and crafts movement. Um, there was a lot of pieces drawn from that movement. So um, Frank Lloyd Wright is definitely an inspiration for this room. You know, Amani, I can't help but think that if Madam Walker could look down at us at this very moment, that she would be very proud of you and thrilled to think that in some way she was part of your inspiration. It's a stunning tribute to a very special woman. Congratulations. Thank you. Today, Madam Walker's home has undergone an amazing design transformation. But what has happened to the original furnishings in this palatial home? The answer is coming up next on Designing for History, the Madam Walker Show House. For questions or comments, please write to Designing for History, the Madam Walker Show House, care of HGTV, Box 50970. Knoxville, Tennessee, 37950. Be sure to include your daytime phone number. Villa Luaro stands as a monument to Madam C.J. Walker's success and her contribution to our society and to our history. Even today, those who see it and enter its doors can appreciate how hard it must have been for an African-American woman to build this mansion with all its grandeur in the early part of the 20th century. Unfortunately, all that's left is the magnificent home itself. Because of the Great Depression, there was a huge auction at Villa Loaro 11 years after Madame Walker's death. Her lavish possessions, the best of furniture, one-of-a-kind paintings, fine china, Persian rugs, Aubusson tapestries, were all sold at extremely low prices. When it was over, the auction's final take was reported around $78,000 for furnishings and accessories that had cost in excess of $350,000. Today, the design transformation of the show house has recreated Madam Walker's original dream for her home on the Hudson. I am so glad to see that so many African-American designers have been able to contribute to the restoration of the house. But I'm also glad that we're at a point in our history where many of the white designers are as excited about Madam Walker and what she represents and that they love this house just as much as I do. Madam Walker's impoverished beginnings as the child of ex-slaves made her empathetic to others and as a result, the more she acquired, the more she shared. Her home was open to the famous and celebrated, but the humble were not excluded. She built Villa Luaro as much for her own personal enjoyment as to inspire other African Americans to achieve and to succeed. Madam Walker dreamed it would forever be a gathering place for the best and the brightest. And today her dream is once again being realized. I'm Joan Cohn. Thanks for watching.